The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Worship the Lord in the hour wherewith you survive is the great exhortation and admonition on our part. Today, if our life is not being poured down as libation unto Christ, not able to stand for the praise of His glory, not able to stand for the truth by rightly dividing it, then though so many hours have been bestowed upon you, you are not worshipping the Lord, which is fit, which is acceptable, which could be taken care of by Him. The church age is not a period to worry about the eschatological events, rather than to worry to have knowledge about it, and not to eagerly wait when and how these eschatological events will come to place. Because the church age is a period of dead-end prophecy. There is no prophecy in this church age. The only thing what we have right now in this church age is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Bible doctrine. This great mystery doctrine which has been hidden in the past demands continual spiritual growth. This mystery doctrine teaches that God gives each member of the royal family access to divine power in his inner life. As told in Philippians 3.10 while providing the problem-solving devices designed originally for the humanity of Christ, they continue for us as well. Spiritual victory lies in using such kind of an assets. The result is the progressive attainment of spiritual maturity with all the mental and emotional richness that spiritual maturity alone can bring for this church age believers. So great is our privilege, dear brethren, you believe it or not. Thus so great is our opportunity, whether you take it seriously or not. Never in any other dispensation or future in the past will ever be given this great privilege is what we are enjoying right now. That great true value which has been given for us to be enjoyed. That great worth of information which has been given for us completed is that we need to take and we need to have knowledge about these eschatological dispensations, but not to be looking that these eschatological dispensations are coming at hand. And in fact, even so great are these people, they want to dispense these eschatological dispensations. Do you know what? They are much worried to look and to tell when these events will come to pass. When this Israel's prophecy are getting into picture, they don't want to concentrate upon this church age doctrine, but they are interested to look upon these prophecies. Which is really a great shame when we consider why this man being the instrument of having this unique communicational spiritual leadership gift should be communicating the truth, but not communicating the truth have become the instruments of deception. And though we have been given this great privilege, great opportunity, great time, we are not able to realize the true worth of this great privilege, great opportunity and great time that could be ever bestowed upon this sinful mankind. That's why this man, when they appear at the judgment seat of Christ, will be more guilty than Israel. Do you know why? Israel didn't have indwelling trinity. Israel didn't have completed canon of scripture, but then to we the believers have been given this great wealth, we are not used it properly and efficiently. We are not even able to qualify to the standards of Moses, to the prophecy of Isaiah or Jeremiah or any other prophet who could ever live, even the Micaiah of the Ilma, who said, mark my words. And this is the ministry of Lord God, the Holy Spirit in this unique dispensation of the church. That every believer should know and come to the knowledge of truth by growing in grace and in the knowledge of biblical, biblical exegesis. But what they are doing, they are neglecting the one primary thing which is of eternal value. And they are easily letting their room for such kind of evil doctrines which cannot value at all at the judgment seat of Christ. And as long as these people fail to communicate the word of the Lord more accurately, more in depth, more in clarity, 
so long such kind of a speculations about the eschatological events will be rising. So long such kind of an eschatological events will be given for them as a prey that many people will be led to destruction, dear brethren. The six dispensations which could be reviewed under three categories are theocentric, Christocentric, and eschatological. Eschatological is the biblical study of future or final events. Prophecies which are at unfulfilled, anticipated histories concluding two dispensations, which are designated at tribulation and the millennium. The eschatological dispensations are defined as those after the resurrection or rapture or of the church. In other words, they will come occur after the royal family of God is completely formed and transferred to heaven as told in Revelation 3.10. The eschatological dispensations are separate from of the church because they are presented in the Old Testament time, whereas the church remained as undisclosed mystery throughout the Old Testament times. For the Jews, the tribulation immediately precedes the founding of God's promised kingdom on earth. Thus, which approximately seven year period of history as told in Daniel 9.27, Revelation 11.3, 12.6 is the end of divine discipline against Israel. The tribulation is the prophecy of the Old Testament. As told in Isaiah 34.1-6, 63.1-6, Jeremiah 34.3-8, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, Daniel 11.40-45, Zechariah 12.1-3, Zechariah 14.1-2, in our Lord's Oliver Discourse and in Revelation chapter 6-19. This short dramatic era will commence immediately after the rapture of the church and will terminate with the second advent of Christ. It is the time of Jacob's trouble as told in Jeremiah 37 and Daniel's 70th week or 78th seven based on the famous timetable prophecy of Daniel 9.24 through 27. The tribulation might also be called the time of Satan desperation because of the violent power struggle that will occur as told in Revelation 12.12. The first of the tribulation will be a time of relative prosperity and overt world peace. Satan will make this one last attempt to establish a millennium of his own to prove that he is equal with God as told in Isaiah 14, 14. But the devil has only his own interests at heart. He cares nothing for mankind but merely wants to use man to prove himself justified in revolting against God. Behind the scenes, Satan will be clamping the human race in tyranny through power politics and religious manipulation. Tyranny always flows into the vacuum created by the absence of divine establishment. Evil will be unrestrained the tribulation because the royal family which is indwelled by the Holy Spirit will have been removed at the rapture as told in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. The outbreak of evil will reveal, through contrast, the historical importance of mature believers as channels for divine blessings. At the beginning of the tribulation, there will be no believers on earth. The church's invisible restraining influence will be gone from the devil's world. In this sudden absence of a spiritual poet, Satan will have his freest hand. But when Satan is left virtually to his own devices, the world situation will turn grim, characterized by an initial false prosperity that soon deteriorates into horrible disaster. Satan's arrogance will be ultimately revealed in his incompetence. Given every chance, he cannot rule the kingdom he usurped from Adam because he is not omnipotent. Human failures will multiply under Satan's administration until, through a Con contagion of bad decisions and shockingly large portion of the earth's population will destroy itself as told in Revelation 6, 1-11. Except for Eden and the millennium reign of Jesus Christ, utopias are marks for co-erision, slavery and violence. Neither man nor Satan, who is far more capable than man, can create a politically and socially perfect world. In the middle of the tribulation, God will eject arrogant, scheming, belligerent Satan from the courtroom of heaven, where he has enjoined free access as defense counsel throughout the appeal trial of this angelic conflict, as told in Revelation 12, 7 through 9, in comparison with Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and Zechariah 3, 1. With Satan cast down to earth, the second of the half of the tribulation will witness unprecedented violence as Satan's Machinchenians 
machinations unravel and he desperately struggles to reveal his rule over the world. This later part of the dispensation is the period actually called the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24-21, Revelation 7-14. Satan will commit all his forces to exterminating the Jews in Revelation 12-17. His purpose will be to eliminate all potential beneficiaries of God's unconditional covenants to Israel. The devil will pursue this heinous policy in an attempt to prove God unfaithful to his promises. Satan will know from scripture the fulfillment of God's covenant to Israel is imminent. The millennium will be only months away. But reasons Satan, if no regenerate Jew, remains alive, God would be unable to keep his promises and fulfill his prophecies. There would be no one to receive the promised blessings. And if God could not fulfill his unconditional covenants, a blasphemous and unthinkable presumption, his character would be flawed. And Satan would have grounds for demanding dismissal of the charges against himself and the fallen angels. But Satan's ploy will not succeed. In spite of a deceptive peace followed by horrible violence, the gospel of salvation will be presented more intensively during the tribulation than in any other dispensation. With the church removed and with Israel remaining under divine discipline until Christ's second advent, no client nation will be operating on earth. Instead of a client nation, God's principal missionary will be 1,44,000 Jews, evangelists, that is Revelation 7, 4 through 8. They will risk martyrdom to present the gospel throughout the world, supporting and supplementing the function of these evangelists. Angels will also join the presentation of the gospel as told in Revelation 14, 6 to 7. Furthermore, two Old Testament prophets, Moses and Elijah, will be resuscitated for a brief but powerful ministry in Jerusalem in Revelation 11, 3 to 13. By all these diverse means, the entire earth will be evangelized thoroughly in a brief span of the tribulation. The principle is grace precedes judgment. An, unpre an unprecedented world war will break out in the last half of the tribulation where with watching his utopian kingdom fragment and co collapse into chaos, a desperate Satan will set vast humans and demonic forces into motion. The ensuing war will continue into the Armageddon campaign in which the forces of four great political powers will converge on Palestine. And in Jerusalem, a remnant of Jewish believers will refuse to surrender, brilliantly commanded by aggressive spiritually mature generals, as told in Zechariah 12, 5-6, this besieged Few will fight for their lives against overwhelming odds. The situation will appear utterly hopeless. The last chance of survival will collapse. Then suddenly, Lord Jesus Christ will return to earth and join the battle. And tomorrow we shall continue the millennium. It should not be a mixed up because it is a tough subject to be understood. But the one simple concept about this Jewish people is that our Lord will not make Satan's ploy to come into force, no matter what it is, which is a blasphemous and unpardonable thinkable, that our Lord will lose the battle. Our Lord, what is promised to the Jews, though Satan attacks to them to be killed off, this presumption will not come to pass. Satan's ploy will not succeed, because our Lord shall reign forever and forever, irrespective of the things that could happen in this world. Even in the tribulation as well, the greater tribulation, the, the second three and a half years of this world. So tomorrow we shall continue the discourse about the millennium. So the closing moments being dedicated to those who are here without Christ, without hope and without eternal life. You know what I believe an unbeliever tells in the privacy of his soul that he believes upon Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he can be saved in this unique great dispensation termed out as Alakanicatesis. For the believer it is very simple to grow in grace under the knowledge of Bible doctrine, to know and to understand what is his value, what is his place and what and how goes the client nation to God as he has been though Gentile in this world. And whereas for a pastor teacher is to train up thoroughly in these dispensations so that the people shall know the truth and the truth shall set them free and the believers can join in this battle so that they can reign to the maximum under Lord's grace for the praise of his glory and his grace by learning and reaching to that invisible heroship and status quo of maximum glorification unto Christ. So which way you want to go, you decide. So, Father, we are grateful for the privilege that thou hast given to fellowship with thee through thy word. We pray that, Lord God, the whole Spirit will enlighten us in these things. For we ask in the name of King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the bright morning star. In Christ's name we pray, Father. Amen.